Welcome back. Minimum wage increases are set to take effect tomorrow in two states, the District of Columbia and 14 other local municipalities. This, of course, on the heels of a devastating report about the effects of Seattle's first increase in the nation's $15 an hour minimum wage. Joining us right now is the Employment Policies Institute Managing Director, Michael Saltzman. Michael, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having and me. And the University of Washington study found that the minimum wage increase in Seattle was actually taking money out of people's pockets, and there were layoffs. Tell us, explain this. Why was this a negative in Seattle? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I think what Seattle was betting is that they could raise the minimum wage and sort of techies and tourists there would pay for it. But what we're seeing now from this study is that that hasn't been the case. Employers have had to find other ways to offset the cost. And so uh, there was a 9% drop in hours for affected employees. This was 3.5 million hours per quarter of work that had been lost. And so as a consequence, even though people earned higher hourly pay, they were losing so many hours at work that on net, many of them were actually worse off by about $125 on average. Michael, Mitch Rochelle, one of the things that I worry about is youth unemployment. And if you look at cities where youth unemployment is very high, crime is very high. Could this potentially, because some of those minimum wage jobs are also young, you know, adults. It, could this be another trend we have to worry about? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, in a number of cities right now, we're kind of in the heat of summer job season and youth unemployment rates in some markets still above 25 or 30 percent. The kind of jobs that we're talking about here aren't just for paychecks. It's the kind of jobs that do give people those skills that sort of help them get the next job. And I think if they miss out on that, then they're more likely to be unemployed later in life and also more likely to get into some of the issues you mentioned, like, uh, like crime and I think other kind of less productive ways to spend their time. Michael, Mary Kissel here. Uh, the argument on the left is that you need a quote-unquote living wage, but how long do employees actually stay on the minimum wage? You know, so there's good data on this, Mary. You know, economists have looked at this and found that, on average, a typical minimum wage employee earns a raise within one to 12 months on the job. Uh, when the minimum wage would remain the same between the Clinton and the Bush years, uh, by the end of that time period, almost no one was earning the minimum wage because so many people earned a raise on their own. I think the key is that making sure that uh, you don't raise the minimum wage so high that those stepping stone opportunities people have no longer exist, that they're automated or otherwise eliminated as employers look for ways to cut back. But to ask you a question about the movement in this country, the fight for 15, which, by the way, we should point out, that movement largely funded by unions, so go figure that. But will this study and the reality of hiking of the minimum wage to such extreme levels, will it stop these municipalities and even states from doing it? Well, I think that there are some members of the labor movement and some advocates who are sort of the equivalent of members of the Flat Earth Society. And I'm not sure any kind of scientific <laughs> evidence is going to um, sway them. I think for more thoughtful policymakers, they are going to look at this and they are going to think, you know what, maybe we need to take a step back. Even in far left Minneapolis today, which is going to be considering a $15 minimum wage, they're having discussions about whether they need to extend the phase in or do something else to sort of lessen the blow. I think it will have an impact. Uh, I think the key, though, is making sure that people understand um, that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And just because this new UW study says this, it's not an outlier. This is, this is part of a long track record of study that really have shown consistently that even at smaller levels, minimum wage hikes really do cause job loss. Yeah, and I think you make a really good point in terms of what this means for young people, because when you have the minimum wage job, that's largely what? College students? I mean, uh, I mean, I know you can't yeah, characterize yeah. everybody yeah. in that category. It's, it's, it's generally, Mary's right, generally first job. Right. So, uh, Michael, if, if they don't get the job first time around when they're just getting out of school, that can snowball and, and really hurt their job prospects later on. That's right. I mean, if they, if, they're not, if they don't get their first job, they're not going to get their second job. I mean, on average, you've got about 1,500 young people dropping out of high school on average every day. And so oftentimes these jobs are sort of a, an opportunity of last resort when maybe the schools have failed them, maybe their families have failed them. When you eliminate those opportunities and say, you know, you have to pay $30,000 a year full time to hire someone who's 16 or 17 years old, you've basically left them with no option at all. Yeah, you make a really good point. Michael, thanks so much for weighing in this morning. Yeah, thanks good for having me. Good to see you, sir. Michael Saltzman there.